Ladies and gentlemen, you have seen him in everything from Hamlet to Harry Potter. Please welcome five-time Academy Award nominee, Kenneth Branagh. I've never met before. We have not. I'm such a fan. Well, thank you very much. Ever it's since it's Henry it's V, since I first, we all got to kind of know you back then uh, in America from that film. Extraordinary you. sort of debut for our for us. And now Dunkirk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is uh, already it hasn't been released. Some people have seen the reviews are amazing. It's yeah, yeah. going to be the movie of the summer. It's people say it's incredibly exciting, deeply affecting, yeah, yeah. showing both the horror of war and also the beauty of human sacrifice. Uh, and love for their fellow man and what they're willing to do for both country and humanity. Um, but we in America don't know the story of Dunkirk very sure. well. Did you grow up with the story of what happened? Well, we, we grew up with a, a something called Dunkirk spirit, which is this sort of sense of never say die, never surrender. And it was born out of this operation where in May of 1940, uh, 400,000 men, most of the British army, had been uh, uh, forced back to the beach at Dunkirk uh, on the coast of France. Let me have a map. Let me show the Ooh, people great. out there where, where Dunkirk is and how close it is to England. So yeah. there's that red dot. There's Dunkirk yeah. in France. And... It's just 26 miles? 26 miles. So the entire British army were trapped there, and the German forces had them under attack from behind with, with land forces from above and from the sea. So there was a thing called Operation Dynamo, and the goal was to get those men back home. Um, and it was incredibly difficult, and it produced a kind of amazing miracle, which was to invite the civilian fleet uh, of, of boats from the southern half of, of, of England to come and help. Pleasure boats, sailboats, yeah, exactly. fishing boats. A guy, a guy canoed over there. A guy went over in a canoe. Can you 15 believe? 15-foot boat. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 26 miles to just get some, you know, 400,000 people. That's a lot of people. And the expectation, the hope from Winston Churchill, who'd been uh, Prime Minister for just 16 days at that point, yeah. was that maybe they would get 30,000 men back. That's what they hoped for. Uh, and in the end, 360,000 people were rescued from that beach. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. amazing. And if that And, and the thing is that this is the British Expeditionary Force. This is the British Army. Exactly, exactly. This, you're all in here. If this force gets wiped out, it's going to be a much different war absolutely. for all the Allies. You're absolutely right. Exactly, because if, in fact, if that, ha if that rescue hadn't occurred, if home hadn't come for them, if every sort of man, woman, and child hadn't, hadn't come across those 26 miles of rough water under attack, then the world would have, would have changed because there's no question that Britain would have fallen prey to the Nazi threat, Europe would have changed completely, and who knows what would have happened for this great country of yours. Thank goodness. Part of what happened here when this rescue occurred was that I think the American people responded with some... Uh, delight and surprise and awe and, and saw some of what we were talking about, some Dunkirk spirit, and I think it had a big impact on the decision to come help us. Well, D-Day was uh, a, a direct reversal of this moment. Yeah, absolutely. And not far from that spot. Just, Normandy's yeah. just down the it beach is, a bit. It is, it is. It's amazing that all of those people left in May 1940, and then, with all of your help, Mm -hmm. They came back four years later. I met some of the, the Dunkirk veterans. There are, uh, we met about 30 last week at the UK premiere. They're in their mid 90s. They came now. to the film. They came oh, to the movie. Oh, that must have been extraordinary. It was pretty to watch the movie with amazing. Them. I said, What did you think of the film? Uh, they said, The film was louder than the battle. Um, <laughs> it was. <laughs> uh, which I think, I think really, really tickled Chris Nolan. They said what happened was that everything that Chris Nolan puts into the movie was as they experienced it. They said it was, I mean, in that sense, it was, it was beyond exhilarating and, and scary. Uh, but the noise of the bombs at Dunkirk did fall away on the air. It's a massive, massive stretch of beach. But trapped in Chris Nolan's amazing vision of this conflict, you, you, you can't get away from the sound of the bombs. Well, I think we have a clip here, and I think in this clip is when you're, you're a commander, you're a royal commander who? Uh, uh, Bolton, he's a naval commander, and I think this piece is yet one more of those moments when there's tension between the forces, between, in this case, the Navy and the Army, about what's the best way to get the men off this beach. But it's right there. You can practice. Being yeah. home doesn't help us get there, Colonel. They need to send more ships. Every hour the enemy pushes closer. They've activated the small vessels pool. Small vessels? It's the list of civilian boats for requisition. Civilian? 
We need to destroy it. Small boats can load from the beach. Not in these conditions. But I'd rather face waves than dive bombers. First book. I love this story. I, I cannot wait to see this movie. When I was a boy, the first book I ever chose myself to read in a single sitting was Silence Over Dunkirk. It's an, really? it's an amazing story. Really? I just cannot wait. Really? Now, one of the incredible things about this is, can we have that map up again, Jim? One of the incredible things about this is that, as I said, we, we first got to know you in Henry V, mm -hmm. and, uh, which ends with the Battle of Agincourt, which is just, just below where that D is in Dunkirk, sure just is. below the D yeah. in Dunkirk there. And that's, what, 800 years ago? Absolutely. Something like that? Absolutely. So battles have been going back and forth across this. They have. And, and I think the, in, in, in Henry V, the Battle of Agincourt was yet another amazing underdog story as a piece of drama. 5,000... Brits were against 30,000 French, and, and they won in an incredible reversal of fortune. And there's something about the underdog story, isn't there, that I don't know whether that was part of your interest in reading that book, but the miracle, the human miracle of Dunkirk or something like Agincourt is what sort of takes you really very personally into the heart of these stories. One of the amazing things about Chris Nolan's film is that you're aware of its epic scale. It's such a white-knuckle ride to experience. If you, if you see this movie, you're going to have to get ready for something. But you, you experience the great big epic thing that is being amongst those 400,000 and feeling all these bombs and the planes and the boats and the weather changing, but you also live it through really, really personal stories and they invite you at all times to go, well, what would I do? What would I do? When I, I seen this movie three times, the first time I saw it and afterwards I was just awash. It was so moving, so, so emotional. The second time I found myself understanding much more of how brilliant Chris Nolan's scheme of it was and the third time I was really, really exhilarated by it, admiring, admiring it so much. And it's that sort of human touch. He puts the personal and the epic together. It's, it's, a, it's a really, um, you know, he's done a wonderful thing. Hats off to him. It's uh, marvelous. I have a friend who saw it, and she said that uh, it is a deeply emotionally affecting movie. And she says, it's like a, a, a two-hour panic attack that you're so glad you had. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a brilliant way of putting it. I feel you should tick a box before you go in, going in say, saying fight or flight because you're absolutely in that adrenalized moment. But it made really, what he does, he seems to make the audience sort of sign something that says, you know what, f f you, I'm not gonna give you time to think. You will only have time to feel and react just like these people in the movie so that by the end of it, you'll feel you were right there with them. Well, um, as I was saying, like we first got to know you uh, in Henry V, and of course we've seen your Hamlet, and we've seen your As You Like It, and um, did you always love Shakespeare, even as a boy? Did you take to it? No, I was. I, 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 came, I come from a working-class Belfast uh, family, and uh, my parents were not remotely associated with books or Shakespeare. Or what the happened theater. to your accent? Well, I guess <laughs> when I was nine, I came to I came to uh, to England, and uh, at that time, I guess you want to just kind of blend in and sure, fit. Sure. And frankly, also, you want to be understood. And, and, and people were so incredibly intolerant of accents. It's amazing. I think people are much more tolerant of accents now, aren't they? Do, do you think? In terms uh, of just ac accepting that this incredible, sure. this diversity, and it's all, sure. you know, it's great. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 But no one, no one, people didn't like your accent as a boy. Well, I think the, the, the they just, I think it was, it was a, a, something that got, had the, uh, there was quite a lot of ribbing about my accent. Can you get it back? Day. Ever does it ever come back? In of course, it comes back, Stephen. My accent comes back absolutely because I, I, I think sometimes if there was a second movie of Taken, that I could possibly play Liam Neeson's granddad and say, <laughs> and say, I have, a, I have a very particular set of skills. <laughs> and if you do not return my daughter to me, I will find you and I will kill you. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I interrupted you about Shakespeare. So, so you're a little boy, you're a young man, you know, and you're learning Shakespeare, and it, you don't like it, or you? Well, we got to. We were asked to read it out loud at school first time when I was 13. We read The Merchant of Venice. I had no idea what was going on. It might as well have been reading the the, the phone directory. And then we went to see uh, we went to see a production of Romeo and Juliet, and I was completely besotted with the girl playing Juliet. I felt like during that show I went through puberty. It was like a, <laughs> it was whoa. Oh, it was so thrilling. It was so thrilling. And, it, you know, there were fights and there were gangs. And I wanted to be in the gangs and it seemed kind of cool. Like, the guy climbed the balcony, looked pretty butch and, you know, look, look, that would be the way to get the girl. He, you know, he spoke a lot. Thought, well, maybe that's a technique as well. Maybe I, maybe I should speak a lot and hang out under balconies, you know. Uh, 
But it was mainly, it was mainly, I think, frankly, you know, Shakespeare at that time was Shakespeare equals forgive me, Shakespeare equals sex. That's what got me. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think you're alone. Yeah. <laughs> well, Kenneth, lovely to meet you. Thank, Thank you so much for being here. Dunkirk opens today. It's out now. Kenneth Branagh, everybody. We'll be right back.